Chris once again on the show. Always a pleasure. Uh, JJ French from Twisted Sister. And of course, from the French Connection podcast. Uh, and uh, author. Author of uh, uh, Twisted Business, correct? Yeah. Yeah. So it's yeah, on, and, and uh, thank you. Thank you for having me up at 8 o'clock. <laughs> you know, maybe I have a good radio voice at 8 o'clock in the morning. A Jewish Barry, do, White, a Jewish Barry White thing. <laughs> um, yeah, and, and, I, and I write for, you know, Copper Magazine and, and mm -hmm. Goldmine Magazine and uh, Tone Quest Magazine, a whole bunch of things. Of getting over, I'm trying to deal with Jeff, the death of Jeff Beck right now mm, uh, because yeah, that really yeah. sent shockwaves across the, the world. You know, even I took all the guitar player buddies of mine. It was just devastating. Um, you know, like I wrote in the article, in my article that disappeared in, in Copper, which you can read if you wish by going to a website called PS Audio. That's P as in Peter, S as in Sam, PS Audio slash copper c-o-p-p-e-r that's the magazine on the ps audio site and you can find my articles under the heading twisted systems that's my article anyway you know what i wrote about it was uh if you think about our guitar heroes mm -hmm. you can almost always connect them to drug and alcohol abuse you know like what how keith is alive who knows eric has been through stuff but we never hear from jeff jeff was never part of that you know, drug and alcohol thing. So we don't, we never thought he would die. You know, just Jeff is always there. He's always making great records. He's always touring and he's groundbreaking and he's phenomenal. Now the argument is greatest of all time. You know, he's the greatest of all time. And that's a, that's a crazy, um, that's a crazy concept because, uh, because Jimmy Hendrix has always been regarded as probably the greatest. And the problem is Jimmy's been dead for 52 years and in that 52 years of time, Jeff Beck has pioneered new ways to do things, you know, and Jimmy probably could have too, but Jimmy died. So let's talk about where they were at the same time. You know, let's, let us not forget that when Jeff Beck saw Jimmy Hendrix for the first time at a club called the Bag and Nails in December of 1966 in London, he walked out and went, what's the point of playing? That was Jeff Beck's regard. That was Jeff Beck's comment after seeing Jimmy. He goes, he just turned to Pete Townsend and Eric and he goes, why am I even playing guitar? So let's begin there. And that's Jeff Beck. And why am I even playing? That's how many light years ahead Jimmy was at that time. And, you know, that was 66 going into 67. So then from 67 to 70 to 70, when Jimmy died, you can look at their careers. Jeff Beck with Jeff Beck group together made some spectacular albums. Truth and Beck all of them spectacular. You know, but Zeppelin recorded the first two Zeppelin albums, and then and Hendrix came out with "Are You Experienced," "Axis Bold of Love," "Bold as Love," and "Electric Ladyland," and rewrote the book again uh, with those with those albums. And then Jimmy dies, uh, and then Jeff reinvents himself again. You know, I thought about this. This is kind of crazy, but but follow me here. You know, I say I used to go to the Fillmore East all the time. You know, that's that's where our concert hall was. I'm, I'm seventy yeah, years yeah. old. So I realized that um, in one six-month stretch of time, I saw Zeppelin twice, Jeff Beck twice, and Jimi Hendrix once in one six-month run of time. So from from uh, May of of '69, I saw so I saw the Jeff Beck group in May of '69. Then I saw Zeppelin second show in New, uh, the second night play in New York in in so May third sixty nine I saw the Jeff Beck group May thirty first sixty nine I see Led Zeppelin then on July third sixty nine I see Zepp I see Jeff Beck again and on January thirty first I see Jimi Hendrix and Band of Gypsies amazing so uh, you know so so I've that was all within a six month stretch. For seven like, bucks. For yeah, seven well, bucks. No, 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 no. Three dollars each. <laughs> That's great. Three bucks. Tickets are three, four, and five dollars. <laughs> what a steal. Go ahead. Oh, wait, wait. Want to hear even crazier? Led Zeppelin played the, the Central Park Shaver Festival. I saw them there too. Tickets were a dollar for that. A dollar and a dollar fifty for that. And I saw them at the pavilion, the pavilion out at World's Fair for three dollars. Okay. Unbelievable. Yeah. So that was unbelievable. Right. And, and and you could go to, and you have four shows a weekend. So for 12 bucks, you could see him four times. That's even 
crazier. But putting that aside of that craziness, the fact is that I saw Stuart, I saw uh, Jeff Beck Group, Led Zeppelin, and Jimi Hendrix um, within six months and trying to remember the impact they had on me at that time, at that time. So I remember Jeff Beck was still playing a Fender Telecaster, I think. Jeff Beck was great, but Rod Stewart was his lead singer. And what I remember most was that Rod was uh, singing, but you couldn't see him because he was hiding behind the PA system. It's a famous story. He was so scared. And Jeff Beck had to go behind the PA and kick him in the ass, and he goes flying across the stage. And that was a famous story. So mm -hmm. I remembered the Jeff Beck group for that. And also, Rod is a great vocalist. Let's be, let's, you know, he was great. Yeah. And okay. So we saw that. You know, and then, um, you know, and Jeff Beck had, you know, had, had Truth and Beckola at the time, and they were super heavy. He was playing through Univox amplifiers, which is strange. He wasn't using Marshalls. So I don't know why. Then Zeppelin comes out. Uh, they had played first in, in uh, January of 69. This is the second time they played at the Fillmore. And you know who opened for uh, Led Zeppelin was the Woody Herman Jazz Orchestra. So I have a poster of Woody Herman and a clarinet and Led Zeppelin on the same poster. Because <laughs> only Bill Graham would have a show like that. Okay. And uh and um and Zeppelin was they had Jimmy stopped playing Fenders. He was playing a Les Paul through a Marshall half stack that night. And uh, Zeppelin played the whole second album that night. And that was really great. You know, that was really intense. You know, that was that was pretty remarkable. I was front row for that. That was really i remember clearly how impressed i was with jimmy's playing and then and then uh and then i saw him at the in the, in the they played in central park for a dollar but when you go see them in central park you don't need to be in the venue because it was a skating rink with a fence around it and if you couldn't get in you just sat outside i mean it's so loud it doesn't matter i mean so i i don't think i was in i think i was sitting on the lawn selling weed or something and just listening and then you know on new year's eve 69 i saw um band of gypsies so uh and that was a, re a revelation jimmy was ridiculous that night and that was something i walked away going wow that may be the greatest thing i've ever seen in my life so with that in mind you know jimmy dies a couple of years uh, jimmy dies shortly uh, in, in i think 71 and uh and he was 27 when he died so all these guys are like 25, 26, 27. Think about that for a minute. They're all 25, 26, 27. Let, let's talk about that for a second. Um, all of our rock heroes were like, you know, 24, 25, 26, 27. When I was 17, the Beatles, the Stones, the Who's, Zepp, Floyd, Grateful Dead, Bob Dylan, Jimi Hendrix, they're all like 27. Name Incredible. me a 27-year-old rock star these days. It doesn't exist. You know, Just you got 20... You got leaders, years. leaders in, 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 in what they did, right? That, yeah, that's yeah. even the most mind blowing thing. Yeah. yeah, I mean, you got plenty, you got 27 year old pop singer or pop females and 27 year old rappers and all that, but you don't have 27 year old rock stars. Yeah. You've got old rock stars. Oh, anyway, so having witnessed all that stuff really like together, um and, and, and realizing that that then Beck goes on and develops this incredible style of guitar playing over the next 50 years. Okay. You know, guess what? Jimmy's dead. And, and, uh, you know, you developed and Jimmy didn't have the luxury of developing, you know, Eric yeah. didn't change much. Eric stayed the same. Jimmy page got worse as time went on sloppier and eventually straightened himself out. And I guess he's okay today. And I, and by the way, I'm not knocking these people. These were my heroes. All right. Yeah, so these, for sure. These my, Absolutely. These my freaking heroes. You think of the greatest guitar players, though, you know, the ones who when you play and you hear them, you know who they are, not just that they're technically great, but you know who they are. So you can add to this list if you want. But this is the guitar players that I know. I hear them. I tell you who it is. B.B. King. No one sounds like B.B. King. Leslie West. No one sounds like Leslie West. Carlos Santana. Nobody sounds like Carlos Santana. Jimi Hendrix. Nobody sounds like Jimi Hendrix. Jeff Beck, nobody sounds like Jeff Beck. When you get to Eric Clapton, there's a million guys that play like that. It's true. 
Yeah. Like Stevie Ray Vaughan, like yeah. Joe Bonamassa, like a million of them. And, and that doesn't take away how great they are. It's just that they don't necessarily imbue their um, their personality through their fretboard in an individual way. I mean, you know, that's just my opinion. So you may have a feeling of other guitar players. Oh, Eddie Van Halen. I think Eddie Van Halen yeah. sounds Randy like Eddie Rhodes. Van Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Well, I can tell Eddie, I can't always say Randy. If you because all those shredders came out of Southern California, all of a sudden there was Dokken and him and there was I, a, I think I think what happened with Randy Rhodes is he was kind of the first neoclassical guitarist. And because there's so many of those types today, you can't it's sort of like meshed in. Right? Where do you like, put Ingve Malmstein and all that then? But Ingve was after Randy, right? Ingve um, was probably like 80, 83, yeah, he was. 84. I, I guess, I guess he Randy was 81-ish, 80, 81, okay. 82, right? All right. So he kind of like, the four, uh, Yuli John Roth would be the first real uh, like, neoclassical, yeah. like integrating classical with, with, you know, rock and roll that is, or heavy metal, whatever, hard rock. And then you had Randy Rhodes, and then you had Ingve. Mm -hmm. But Yuli John Roth wasn't, he was more of a Jimi Hendrix neoclassical versus... Randy, which was more like metalish. Yeah, I think I think yeah. I wasn't really a big. I know who he is. This wasn't a big big follower of his, but yeah. But no, no. Yeah. But I think you're probably right. You know, there's only so much bandwidth you have to to getting into certain people and what they play like. And so, you know, when you listen to a body of work, I realize that a body of work is uh, is what is owed your artist that you love, so you understand what they're trying to say. You know, like you know. How, people dismiss things they don't like, like, oh, country sucks, rap sucks, this sucks. And that's because you don't pay any attention to it. You don't care. You ask a fan of any genre, and they'll tell you, of course, there's a difference. But if you don't know the difference, you don't care to know the difference, you'll never know the difference, you know? I mean, even country artists make fun of country's sameness. I think it was... Uh, Alan Jackson said, if you play a country record backward, the dog comes back, the car comes back, and the girl comes back, you know? <laughs> and that's a country artist. But, uh, I mean, there's a lot of great country artists out there. I just don't know country enough, but there's a lot of great country artists out there. I don't know jazz enough. I certainly don't know, you know, like Coltrane is considered one of the greatest performers, you know, Miles Davis. I don't know those guys well enough to know. So if it's bandwidth, right? It's bandwidth. You, it's, there's so much yeah. bandwidth. There's but so much you, space you could put in your, you know. But if you listen to Coltrane over and over and over again for like a month, you would understand what he does. You hear his nuances and you could probably then pick it out in another record. You know what yeah. I mean? You go, oh, that's you that's Coltrane. Because you would know it. But if you don't, you don't. So uh, during COVID, I started doing that. I started playing a lot of Coltrane just because I wanted to understand why people regarded him so highly and 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 uh you know then kind of blue by miles davis which is considered the biggest selling it's the abbey road of jazz it's the biggest selling jazz album in the world for better or worse yeah so if you're not a novice to jazz get it and listen to it so i mean i got it and listened to it a lot and and, and coltrane's on in the band so you really can kind of hear so it's a great album I'm really loving it. I, I you know what it. you know what I like about you, JJ. You're very deep in the morning. <laughs> You've got a lot of. You're very deep in the morning. I'm better. You know what? I'm deeper in the morning than I am any other time during the day. I am yeah, much we start more burning deep. out as the day progresses. I start, man. By 11 a.m., I am a veg. I'm a vegetable. <laughs> but you get me at like 8 a.m. right now, and when, when the when, when, boom, the, when, when when the synapses are rocking, and I'm you know, I'm there, man. So okay, so let's. So what do you want to talk about this thing called the, the Heavy Metal Hall of Fame? Well, I mean, yeah, <laughs> yeah. Okay, so the <laughs> we could talk about anything you want, but we'll go on this now. How's that? All right. On the fine. 26th of January, which is next Thursday at the Canyon Club in Agora Hills, California, uh, the Metal Hall of Fame. And the big news is, you know, Twisted Sister is going to be inducted, which is, is, is something that's fabulous. I think the fans are super excited. And the bigger news is the band's actually going to perform. And you guys haven't performed since, whoa, 2016, I think? Yeah, November 16th, I think, 2016. So that's, that's pretty big news. And, and my first question to you is, why was it the right decision to induct Twisted Sister in the Metal Hall of Fame? Uh, I have no idea. <laughs> Those things happen 
without why without do you any, think why do you think i could tell you why i think but. well i think well first of all they wanted to induct aj Pirro, okay as a drummer because i think the people there knew aj and were friends of aj and i said um when I was told that, I went, that's really interesting. You want to you wanna induct AJ? I mean, AJ happens to be one of the best rock drummers in the world, in my opinion. Mm-hmm. I think Mark Mendoza and AJ Perro as a rhythm section are one of the greatest rhythm sections in, in all of metal. But I thought that was a bit peculiar. So I said, just, I think I said, uh, so, so not twisted? Oh, well, we didn't think you guys would come. Or so, it was like, I don't know, or something. And I went try us you know uh and so next thing you know i hear you guys uh, we want to induct you into the heavy metal i'm like okay okay so it was very much uh we i didn't um i wasn't pushing for it at all didn't even you know and uh and then it happened so that recognition is great but i don't know why any of those things happen you know rock and roll hall of fame you know they get together every year they vote and you know they pick people some people are very deserving some people are not in my opinion i'm not a voter so i I don't know how that works sometimes i go really that's rock and roll or that person i don't understand why and then the whole thing is the awards shows in general like you know does it matter i guess i guess it does i guess to the fans it matters yeah that's right because to the fans they go see i told you they were great you know, see, I told you that's the pa- the people who exactly. think they suck. You know, your fans go really well on the rock. They're in the heavy metal hall of fame. You're not. You know, so fuck you. So, I think to the fans, it's an important um, um, validation. That's right. That all the work we put in mattered. That's you right. know. So, uh, you know, I've been thinking about what I'm going to say. You know, at this event, I can and I, my my opening, the opening is going to be well. You know, twenty year old musician came up to me this is a true story 20 year old musician came up to me a couple years ago and said hey man i want you to come see my band and i go oh how long you guys been together he goes oh two years man i said how many shows you you done oh we've done a lot man we've done like 50 shows i went really 50 shows in two years i said what like 45 minute sets he goes yeah i said you've done 50 cool i said well i'll tell you what when you get to 500 contact me i'll come and see you yeah 500 whoa we'll never get to 500 i said well you're gonna suck until you get to about 500 and i don't have time to watch you suck so by the time you get to 500 you may be worth saying and the guy goes well man how many you guys play and i said well the truth is that from the first day we played which was march 23rd 1973 this i can tell you to the first break we took which was in which was a labor day uh weekend 1975 so it's 30 months the first 30 months we played we played 3440 shows 3440 shows and then for the the rest of the time like so from 73 to 82 when we got signed to atlantic we had at 7500 shows and that's how come i guess we're in the heavy metal hall of fame <laughs> you add another you know a couple thousand out of that worldwide touring and you're at over nine thousand and we're, that makes a band good and bulletproof and justifies who we are but at the end of the day is it you know it's a, is it a numbers game you know everyone always throws the numbers around how many records you sell how many blah, 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 blah. you know our resume is 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 good you know like at 25 or 30 million records canada is responsible for a lot of them by the way the band was yeah. enormously much mm-hmm. music really got behind us you know we became a coffee table band up there everybody had to have a copy jj every time i turned on the tv your video was playing like yeah i was like rotation was heavy heavy super heavy so uh you know with that you know multiple platinum and gold records from around the world you know and and uh we headlined 40 countries and uh you know we came back you know, we were turned down more times in a bed sheet in a whorehouse. We've come back more times than Freddy Krueger. I mean, this is this is the story of the band. But you know, at the end of the day, the uh, the single biggest thing for me is that we made a difference in people's lives, yeah. and and they loved us and they supported us. And um, and I got emails from fans saying, you know, because of what you did and how you did it, and always 
we always held you up as an example of people that just you know work and work and work and if you go after your dreams and I, 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 it sounds so corny but at the end of the day what 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 else is there that's it did you change people's lives and the answer is we did and because we did I think that's why it's, uh, you, know. you know what I think it is. I think it's, it's exactly what you said that if you keep on working and keep on bettering your craft, you can do anything you want. It just requires a lot of hard work. And, and it's exactly what you said, you know, you're that sort of model of, yeah, you, if you do work hard, you can make it versus the, Oh, I just, you know, I played two shows. I got a hit single and suddenly I'm famous, you know, uh, American so, Idol or something, you know. Yeah, exactly. Like, so and, I, 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 people ask me what I think about that stuff, you know. And and if you win the lottery, congratulations. But unfortunately, you have no no foundation underneath you. That's the problem. So when the shit hits the fan, you have nothing to figure out how to survive with. But if you're, you know, <laughs> I love I love it when American Idol, you know, they win, they go. Uh, you know, I want to thank my fans for sticking with me for 15 weeks. You know, I'm thinking, <laughs> thinking, you know, 15 weeks. We've been together 50 years. You know, thank you for saving me for 15 weeks. It, it, it comes down to that sort of old thing, you know, like, would you want a brain surgeon who's, you know, operated for 50 hours or 5,000 hours? <laughs> well, you, right. There you that's go. What it comes down to. There you go. See, it's, yeah, that's a perfect analogy. Yeah, it's yeah. perfect. So, you know, if you happen to win the lottery, great. Um, and, uh, you know, don't ever take it for granted. I mean, we played with, I remember the tour we did with Queensryche in, 80, in 83. They had been together for about a year and, and, and they got a great record deal, you know, and we had been together that boy 10 years. And we met up with them in a parking lot in Kansas City. We had, we came in in a, in a, 16 passenger van. They came in in a Silver Eagle tour bus, you know, and I'm looking at this tour bus and I'm going, and they were very nice guys. And I said, man, you know, wow, look at this. And they said, yeah. I said, how long are you going to be together? They said, oh, a year and a half, two years. And I went, how big was your record advance as a $200,000? They were the exception, though. They yeah. were the exception. Uh, to the no, world, but the right? thing was, that, like, I went, I said, how old are you guys? They go, oh, we're 19. So I'm looking at this thing going, we're 30, they're 19. We've been together 10 years, we've been together a year and a half. They have a tour bus. We have a van. They got two hundred thousand dollar record deal. We had like no tour support, um, and uh, and I said, "Man, look at that." So I said to them, "I think I said to one of them, I said, don't take this for granted.' I said, "You guys, you know, guys, and you know, oh, I said, how many shows do you play?" They said twelve. I went twelve. I said twelve hundred and no twelve. I said, "What do you mean twelve? Yeah, we said three with Ozzy, three with Def Leppard, three with." Uh... <laughs> Just was, I went, and they were great, by the way. They were they very are, good there. They were they were yeah. really good band. And they were, you know what? They felt so bad for us. They let us sleep on their bus because they had extra bunks. So we would revolve band members and, and sleep on their bus. And and they were they were great, but you know, sometimes that's the, that's the way it goes. You, you know, JJ for Queensrake, I think they were sort of the exception that they took another road to get there. Like, you know, they jammed in their basement, they practiced, they 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 finessed their craft. To the point where they, when they did release an EP, it just, it connected with people, right? But not like in a pop artist connection, in a sort of like an underground connection. Oh, like a, you know, they were like, um, they were like an American Iron Maiden or something. You That's know? right. Exactly. They were, they were, we played, uh, we did a whole tour with them. I watched them every night and they were great. Yeah. They were super young, but I thought they were like more Maiden-esque. You know, yes, as a, as a, time, they were yeah. more than AC and DC and Priest was us. Yeah, they were they were more Maiden esque. Uh, but Jeff was one of the best vocalists I'd ever heard. Yeah. Oh, they were all great. Yeah, yeah. And, and great yeah. guys and a great band. And uh, just I'm just doing that to illustrate. You know, how I, absolutely, absolutely. Different, I, 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 different I guess roads my, my, my my point is they they chose another road, but they worked hard at that road too. It's just a different yeah. way. You know. Yeah. Well. Yeah. All right. Yeah. So speaking of uh, greats, Mark Portnoy is gonna is gonna is gonna Mike play Portnoy. drums. Mike Portnoy, right. yeah, yeah. Um, tell me about you know the decision to use him again. Well, you know, Mike Portnoy and Steve Vai are going to induct us. There you go. And the reason why they are going to induct us forget is that they used to sneak in to see Twisted Sister when they were fifteen years old in the bars in Long Island. This is Steve Vai. And Mike Portnoy. Um, 
two of the greatest rock musicians on the planet. Yeah. And, um, you know, when AJ died, um, for those of you who don't know, AJ was in a band called the Adrenaline Mob, and and he that was his side gig. So when Twisted wasn't on the road, he was on the road with Adrenaline Mob, and he died in the tour bus of Adrenaline Mob in a parking lot in in Poughkeepsie, New York. He had a heart attack, and he died. And um, he replaced Mike Portnoy, who was in Adrenaline Mob. So Mark Portnoy has been in every band that's ever been signed on the planet Earth. I, I make a joke. I said, ladies and gentlemen, when he's not on tour with the Beatles Stones, who's a Floyd, Jimi Hendrix, Grateful Dead, Jefferson Airplane, he's playing with us. Because Mike Porno is just a playing whore. And he, does, he plays with everybody. He's an, I don't even know how his brain functions. He remembers more shit. He knows way more stuff than we do about us than I do. I, you know, I'm sure when we get together and rehearse, he'll know. Oh, he, you fucked that up, JJ. Thanks, Mike. I appreciate you telling me that. I know that part. But Mike just has an encyclopedic performance mind, and he happens to be a great guy. So anyway, the thing is that the AJ dies, and the day after AJ died, there was a memorial show in in New Jersey. Mm-hmm. Adrenaline Mom put on the the show, and I went. Uh, because they asked me would, to appear on behalf of Twisted Sister and play a song with Adrenaline Mob, and I and I'm sitting there and it, and and Mike Portnoy was there, and Mike Portnoy and I were in the dressing room. We had never met officially, and we were both crying because AJ just died 24 hours before. We're both like crying, like I can't. I mean, Mike knew AJ, and and you know AJ I think said to Mike at one point, if anything ever happens to me, I want you to be my, the drummer or something like that. But anyway, um. Mike looked at me and he goes, uh, he says, man, uh, what are you guys going to do? Because we had a tour lined up. And I went, I I don't know. I don't know. We haven't even discussed it. This could be it. And he said, well, look, I'm not touring this summer. And if you need a drummer, call me. I'm available. Now, I have to tell you, that within a minute of the announcement that AJ died, my office was inundated with a million phone calls from drummers. And I remember saying to my assistant, anyone who's calling for AJ's job, blacklist them for me. I never want to talk to them again. Like if you wait, if you can't wait for the body to get cold, I don't need to talk to you. Like that's how I felt. I was so, I, I, I don't know. I guess I was naive in thinking about it. I would get these calls. Hey man, it sucks about AJ, but my name is blah, blah, blah. And I could play drum. And it was really disgusting. And anyway, but here's Mike and I in the dressing room. Mike just looks at me and he goes, if you guys need help, call me. That was it. And I went, wow, wow, okay. So we attended AJ's wake a couple of days later, and we're all sitting around Dee's father-in-law's house in Staten Island discussing the future of the band. And I went, you know... Mike Portnoy offered his services should we decide to continue. Now, at that point, the whole European Festival uh, tour was set up that summer. So we, all these promoters, are now calling to find out because we're headlining 15 festivals. And we're telling them, "Give give us some time because we can't process this. It's too traumatic. And, you know, kind of like you don't ask a don't ask someone that loses a Super Bowl the next day if they're retiring, you know, just give them some space, whatever, you know, or if you lose a boxing match or something, you you can't make those decisions when you're traumatized. You need a you need some space. So, uh, you know, we were so um, blown away by Mike's offer and we thought about it and said, you know what? Oh, we'll take you up on it. And that's how you become our drummer. So anyway, um, Outside of him, Frankie Benali is the only other person who played drums with us uh, because Mike couldn't make the Las Vegas Awards show six years ago. And Frankie was there because he's in California. Yeah, this yeah, is before yeah. the cancer diagnosis. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And Frankie was also a great friend of AJ. And Frankie played that one night. It was fun, that Frankie. But Mike just became the our drummer. And so anyway... Uh, getting to this thing, so the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame, excuse me, the Heavy Metal Hall of Fame comes up. So we're thinking, okay, well, we'll just show up and get the award and go home. I mean, that was really it. 
I don't live in LA. D does. I said, D, why don't you just go and get the award? Say thank you on behalf of the band. Thank you. That's it. Just that's it. But if you're not in LA, maybe I'll fly out on behalf of the band. And that started the conversation about what does it mean? And we haven't been together since we broke up. And so I think I think we all thought maybe it'd be a cool thing, a fun thing to do. Play three songs, you know, like that's it. So we're going there. We're going to rehearse three songs. You're going to go rehearse. Do you really need to rehearse? Well, the fact is you kind of do when you've been out of it so long. I don't play professionally anymore. So, I mean, I really need to like, you know, you need to put the shoulder pads on and the helmet on. You have to kind of just you have to kind of get yourself in a state of mind of to do it. Because because it does take a certain thing to do it. You know, you have to adjust yourself to the volume because you don't normally do that. We're older now, you know, yeah. um, and so uh, as time goes on, you know, it's this is very reminiscent of other past reunions. Uh, in 2000, we played a special one-off for Jason Flom, the a r guy. Uh, he was being honored by the UJA in New York City, and we, uh, and so all a lot of the artists that that were that he signed over the years appeared to play in a little restaurant in New York, in a little Italian restaurant. Uh, not, uh, a little time, a little restaurant called Tavern on the Green in Central Park. It was Matchbox Twenty, the Blue Man Group, because he went to college with the Blue Man Group. Matchbox Twenty, Kid Rock. Um. Oh God, Sebastian Bach. Uh. So uh, everybody was was appearing and playing basically unplugged because it was at a restaurant. Wow. Yeah. And we hadn't been together in twelve years, and so we all met. We, we had a rehearsal, but Mark couldn't make it. And we had a rehearsal. And then we all we all met behind the stove. We Because Jason didn't know we were appearing. And we were all crouched behind the stove in the kitchen. I'm thinking to myself, this is how the band's reuniting. You know, like we're crouched behind the stove in a kitchen in Central Park. And this is it. Anyway, we came out, we did three songs. Didn't think, too, didn't think twice about it. Um, we wound up... Uh, you know, on stage with us was Matchbox 20, was Kid Rock, was the Blue Man Group, and a bunch of other artists that Jason had, had signed. And, uh, and it was, it was, you know, it was, it was fun. And we didn't think anything of it. And that was that. And then a year later, 9-11 happened. Yeah. And we reunited for that. And that was a charity event. And that was cool. Yeah. And we didn't expect anything to happen from that. And from that, everything happened because the word got out. And now this is, this event is also a charity event. From what I understand, yeah, the money is, is yeah, the yeah. money is donated. So we'll make yeah. yeah. So it's costing us money to do the shows because mm -hmm. uh you know we have uh there's a sponsor, but we we're also paying, you know, sure. to do it. So there's not there's no money involved. Also, you know, there's no reunion um to speak of. I'm not gonna be so cynical and say that it couldn't lead to conversations, but we never had a single conversation about a reunion prior to this. Not one. People always go, when are you guys getting back together? And I said, well, we talk all the time, but we never talk about playing, but we talk about business. Why do we talk about business? Because we're not going to take it. I want to rock are the most famous uh, licensed songs in the history of the music business. They're in more TV commercials, movie soundtracks. So we do licensing deals all day long. I mean, that's really what we do. I'm in the business of music licensing. Yeah. which was a business I didn't know existed 20 years ago. If you said to me, you're going to be in the licensing business, I'd say what marriage license, driver's license. Well, no, we're in the music licensing business. And this year, for example, discover card in the U S where the song discover card mm -hmm. T-Mobile and hundreds of corporations have licensed our music. We're not going to take it as the number one um, protest song in the world. It's sung everywhere. Sung everywhere. Sung on both sides. Yes. Sung. <laughs> yeah, you got that right. It's sung on both sides. The truckers in, in kind of Canada did a video with We're Not Gonna Take It. Yeah. Uh, 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 nurses went on strike in New York, were singing it on the street. You know, I got a newspaper clipping. You know, I mean, it's sung around the world. Uh, Ukrainian freedom fighters. That's right. Both yeah. the left and the right. It's uh, yeah. It's a timeless message and will remain so. And uh, that's kind of an honor too, just to think about that, you know. Um, that that fits in to my initial question of why do you think 
Twisted Sister should be united, uh, re- uh, sort of, wh- why should they receive this award? I think we've sort of, you know, the 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 sort of legacy of Twisted Sister, the sort of uh, social culture that it, it's part of, you know, in, into the everyday's world, right? Social political, we'll call it, right? And of course, album sold, like you said, most licensed song. There's just so many and genre defining, right? In the sense that you guys broke out with the videos, you made the videos popular, music videos, plus just in general, just sales in general, just, you know. And it, yeah, it, so I mean, you add all that up and I guess you've affected a lot of people and, and therefore to be recognized for that accomplishment. It's a huge accomplishment. Yeah, um, you know, and rightfully thing, so. Rightfully there's so. also the Long Island Music Hall of Fame yeah, which we were inducted in that 2006 just opened up their building uh, in Stony Brook, Long Island. And we went to that and that building uh, has Twisted Sisters everywhere. Wow. They've got like six foot models of us. They've got our backdrops. They've got our posters. We're all over that uh, Long Island Music Hall of Fame. You can't walk in there without thinking it's the Twisted Sister Music Hall of Fame almost. So to have that and and the Heavy Metal Hall of Fame. Yeah. as a recognition after all these years uh is something to be very proud of yeah and and i think it's uh, to your point it's the fans to be proud that they supported you all these years right they they feel like you know one of ours sort of made it right yeah that's big for them yeah i mean a lot of them took a lot of abuse you know for that <laughs> you know how cool or not cool they are you know yeah yeah so um yeah it's um you know it's, it hasn't really hit me and it may hit me more when i'm there or actually when we're sitting there playing, you know, and rehearsing these songs and standing on stage and then just um, getting an award. So uh, and it's a then, great event. It's a great yeah, event. Yeah. I've been there many times this year. Unfortunately, I won't be there due to personal reasons, but I'll tell you something. It's a glamorous. You feel like you're at the Academy Awards uh-huh. and uh, it, it feel, and it's just a Pat Gisualdo puts on an, a spectac- spectacular event. It, it's really great. Well, good. So we're really looking for we're looking forward to it, and yeah. um, you know, yeah. to our fellow, you know, have ACDC and Judas Priest, uh, Motorhead. These are bands that we um, are emotionally attached to. Yeah. Uh, either either through the genre that we play, the music that we play, or the personal relationships that we have, uh, and it matters a great deal um, to be yeah. associated with them. I mean, you know, Priest. I just think is really, you know, in terms of metal, it's the bullseye metal sound for us. And then ACDC is just the attitude and the humor is, is, you know, and uh, I mean, when, when Twisted first came to England and Brian Johnson, the well, first time we played in Newcastle, we we're in a hotel and, and all of a sudden a car comes, it's a van and it's a guy says, Hey man, Brian Johnson wants you to come over to his house. <laughs> he heard you were staying here so we went over <laughs> we went over to his house the whole band went over to his house and he said he and it was a it was a bank holiday so which means everything was shut down you know so he goes hey laddie you know he's like hey laddie hungry laddie i went yeah he goes well laddie you know i'll just call up an indian restaurant around here and they'll open for me and we'll, we'll order food and he ordered all this food in him and then brian came and played with us in in uh england in 2010 he did a whole lot of Rosie with us. I have a video of wow, it. It's, that's oh, cool. man, he's just Amazing. So pretty crazy. He, here's my last question to you, okay? Um, you know, here, Twisted Sister is sort of the, the band that's paid their dues, thousands of shows. And then you see bands go on stage, to your point, like, you know, 50 shows they've played and they are lip syncing. And to me, Twisted has never come across as a band that's going to go up there and just fake it. Right, you guys are the real deal, at least from my understanding, what I see, right? You guys would be the last guys to start going up there and using backing tracks. And well, I mean, what are your feelings towards what's going on in music today where you know everyone's just lip syncing stuff and they're not even playing their instruments anymore? It's yeah. well, I, you know, this goes back to my my father's criticism of my genre, which he said our music's not uh, like everything after 1940. 19- 46 suck like he just kind of he just wrapped it all up in one big ball and he goes you all it all sucks right <laughs> like it's all just baby 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 yeah 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 right because he just didn't give a shit he loved classical music 
Mm -hmm. And I don't want to sound like my dad, which means that um, whatever, if you figure out a way to make money and you're selling it, that's your business. Do I like listening to it? Not, no. Um, It's manipulated a lot. So no. But then again, the music business has always been manipulated. Let's also be really clear about this and not naive. You know, there's been a lot of trickery in the music industry. Most live albums are never live albums. Even back in the day, they were like fake live albums. And yeah. very, I mean, they they would they would either go back in the studio, re re-record all the parts again. So let's be let's be honest about that. Very few live albums. I think Dave Edmonds, or excuse me, either Dave Edmonds or Dave Mason made an album and it said, "We officially proclaim that every track on this is live." That they had to make a, a, a they had to make a statement because it was all bullshit, you know. I, I, without naming the artists involved and the producers involved, there was a lot of trickery. So if that happens, who's to say? You know, those who live in glass houses. So uh, if you are going to be part of the world of manipulative uh, media, then you have to expect the manipulative media to continue on in ever more um, elaborate ways. And if you buy it, you buy it. And if you don't, you don't. I hear things differently than my daughter hears things. And so, and and her, you know, and my three-year-old granddaughter will hear things differently than she heard it. And it's their decisions to make, not my decisions, what I think is good or bad. Um, You either like it or you don't like it. So I don't uh, pass judgment because, again, you know, when you hear stories like Tony Bennett took 73 takes to record uh, I Left My Heart in San Francisco or something like that, you know, so what's the difference? Okay, 73 takes. They didn't get it right the first time and they kept reaching for perfection and and that's the point it's this perfection business and um and there's this manipulative desire to reach perfection and if it doesn't sell it's a failure and if it sells it justifies its existence and more people will do it because that's the nature of pop culture which is innovate and then imitate and that's what you do you innovate and you imitate i don't care what genre of music you're in go to liverpool in 1964 when the beatles hit and you had 50 bands that sounded just like the beatles because you innovate and you imitate and if you don't know the difference between them and someone sat you down and played you a beatle record Jerry and the Pacemakers, Billy J. Kramer and the the Dakotas, the Searchers, they all sound like the Beatles. It all all sounded exactly the same if you didn't know the difference. That's the genre situations. Look at the L.A. metal bands of the 80s. If you didn't know the difference, wouldn't they all sound the same to you? The Warrants and the this and the that and the Motley is like, there's no difference. Like, it's just, and that's not a knock. It's just, that's what happens. And then part of it is this. So what do you have now? You have beats, you have hip hop, you have beats, you have rap, you have, you know, and how much of it is, you know, is, you know, innovate and imitate. And that's built into the sauce and, and country artists. Now, what does country sound like? It doesn't sound like Dolly Parton anymore. It doesn't sound like George Jones. It doesn't sound like George Strait. It sounds like Def Leppard with a cowboy hat. You know, that's what that's what country music sounds like to me. <laughs> it's, you know, it's like Mutt Lang's drum sound. And, you know, and then, you know, the guys, you know, you know, driving their pickup truck. And it, I don't know. I, here's the thing. There's so much out there. The good news is that it doesn't cost much to make a record. But the bad news is, Everybody can make a record now. And so we're being forced to listen to. So here's my question to you. Mm -hmm. With all that's out there, how do you pick what you listen to? Do you get it because a friend of yours says, hey, you should really check this out? Like, is that how you get referred to? You know what? I'm a special case. Okay. Because I'm kind of in this sort of industry, right? So I'm getting thrown at by publicists what to listen to all day long so i might not be the best example but i know what you're saying how does someone differentiate and i don't know it's how do they discover right it's not word of mouth that's for sure so it's not word of mouth for you in other words a friend of yours doesn't say man check this out it could be it could be it could be it could be but i get links every day from youtube and saying check this out check this out to the point where i can't check anything out anymore Okay. It's to your point that there's just too much to check out. They don't have enough space in my brain to check it out. And when you do check it out and you like something, 
Yeah. Do you then go deeper in or you just go, well, that's today's, that's today's lunch. I got to find something else. I guess, I guess if it really stands out, I'll, I'll go deeper in and, and, you know, like anyone else. So that's the problem. So for example, a friend of mine is into a band called Tame Impala. Are you familiar with them? They're no, very popular. Ahead, okay, but yeah. they're huge. They can sell multiple nights out at the garden. I never even knew they existed. Yeah. Never knew. A friend of mine says, You don't know Tame Impala? Like I'm an idiot. Like, yeah. All of a sudden, the world of Tame Impala opens up. Oh my God. Tons of records. Great stuff. There's a reason why they're that popular. I don't know them. I don't know their music. I don't know they exist. That 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 kind of blows my mind. Used to be in the old days, everybody that could go to the garden, I would know. Now people sell at the garden. I never heard of them. You must be aware of that phenomenon, right? Yeah. Or artists yeah. who are gigantic, you don't even know about. Um, yeah. And you go, how did that happen? You know, under the all radar. All the time. All yeah, the time. happens all the yeah. time. So yeah. I need somebody to focus me. You know, I write a Beatle column, so I'm, you know, I listen to the Beatles too much, and and uh, much to my wife's dismay, I don't need to listen to another Beatle record for the rest of my life. I mean, let's be fair; I don't need to listen to a Led Zeppelin record for the rest of my life. I don't listen to a Priest record. These records were imprinted in our DNA. The Rolling Stones, the Who, Zep, Floyd, all that stuff is imprinted in our DNA. And what you listen to between between the ages of twelve and twenty is the music that lasts with you for the rest of your life. So, regardless of what happens as you get older, pretty much the music that you fell in love with between the ages of 12 and 20, when you had all the time to spend. That's right. Yeah. You fall in love with, because you know, as well as I do, as you get older, you don't have time to spend anymore. You yeah. got, you, you're married, you got kids, you got school, you got house payments, you know, what all that stuff that gets in the way, you know, it gets in the way of it. But when you're 12 to 20, nothing's in the way of it. You're just getting high and listening to music. And you become, and you, whatever you fall in love with during that period of time, you fall in love with during that period of time. That will never be taken away from you. That's just part of who you are. And yeah. once you get past 20 and 30 and 40 and 50 and life gets in the way, it becomes less and less an opportunity. Not to mention the fact, how much does it cost to go to a show? I mean, look, I am a celebrity. I can call up a promoter. I can go to a show. But yeah. still in all, Let's say I wanted to go to a show and I needed a babysitter and I wanted to pay parking. You know, how much is that costing these days? Buy a hot dog. You want to buy a hot dog? <laughs> Forget you know, about it. What about, a, what about a family of four wants to go to a baseball game? How much does that cost? I brought you know? my son to a hockey game and uh, I was like, don't don't eat chips. Don't eat yeah. pizza. Don't. Yeah. I, I can't imagine. Younger. Yeah, but I'm sure it's a lot of money. You know, I, I don't want to sound like, you know, when, my, when I was, look, when Twisted Sister started, gasoline was 29 cents a gallon you know <laughs> and richard nixon was president that's right. and, and uh you know and and we rented a house for 300 dollars a month and you know that was and that sounds like when i was a boy we walked five miles to school and we had no but think about that think about the the economics of success yeah yeah 29 cents a gallon is how much gas was nixon was president i mean mcdonald's only had one million hamburgers sold back in those days one million <laughs> not eight trillion i remember there was a sign first time i saw mcdonald's it said one million sold. i i never saw mcdonald's living in manhattan we didn't have mcdonald's in manhattan i'm now in the suburbs i see this big golden m thing what's that mcdonald's wow a million hamburgers sold <laughs> Isn't that yesterday now? There, there was no drive through back then. <laughs> it was, it was the chocolate food. shakes. They don't have shakes anymore. <laughs> so, uh, on that note, I'm going to have to let you go. Okay. Uh, always a pleasure, JJ. You know, always welcome back. Uh, you know, you're always welcome back to the show. I love talking to you, man. I love all your philosophy. I love what you think. I love what's, I love picking your brain. You got me up at eight o'clock in the morning. <laughs> I'm so buy my book, Twisted Business. It's on Amazon. Buy the book, Twisted Business. Listen to my podcast, The JJ French Connection, which is on Spotify, Apple, and every other platform. Podcast one. Read my articles in Copper Magazine or uh, or uh, Goldmine um, or Tone Quest, and uh, and and then listen to me pontificate on various podcast hopefully a little a little later in the day but you got me while things were rocking man i'm telling you my brain was working this morning you know so thank you all right very much. and most of all the metal hall of fame oh, happening which, next week yeah which is the 26th which i i don't even know have tickets are available but yes on on, on january 26th yeah. at agora hills at the canyon club in la twisted sister will be indicted no inducted <laughs> sorry <laughs> we'll be, not indicted. It'll be after will, the show will be, uh, well, the indictment will be after the show we'll be inducted to that and and i would like to thank my fellow sisters really d 
and and Eddie and and Mark uh, for killing themselves for all those years. You know, all I right. can't really say enough to them for the sacrifices and Portnoy for being there for us when you need be and for Steve Vai for helping induct us. But to the guys in my band for all the years and the hard work and the sacrifice and we all we all did. Um, I am forever indebted to all of them. Yeah, just a few tickets left. Metalhalloffame.org. You can pick them up there. And I, from what I'm hearing, people are flying from all around the world yeah. to this event just to see you yeah. guys be inducted. Of course, Chris and Pilateri, Lou Graham, Ravens also being inducted and then indicted after the show. So uh, <laughs> there you go. I, I'm, I'm pretty sad that I won't be there this year because I would have loved to see you guys be inducted and perform. But you know what? It is what it is. I know you guys are going to kick some ass anyways. Yeah, well, thank you so much for having me. Oh,